Hudson, and uh, um, I'm here to talk about uh, uh, how to create and maintain productive raised bed gardens, uh, particularly in your backyard. And uh, my information is shown on the first slide here. My name is Leonard Gitenji at VSU, and I'm in charge of sustainable and urban agriculture. At uh, any time, you can reach me. I have provided my number there and my email address. And uh, like Ms. Johnson mentioned, uh, if you have any questions and you want to go ahead and chat it on the chat window, uh, she will share those questions with me and I'll try to answer them. So the format of my presentation is that I'm going to show you a PowerPoint of the, uh, the basic stuff about how to create a consideration when you are thinking of a raised bed garden. I'm also going to show you a couple of videos that uh, show the hands-on component uh, using my backyard. And first of all, uh, when you talk about the raised bed garden, you know, what are we talking about? And raised bed gardens are those form of garden which are raised above the ground. Uh, they are not uh, particularly flat. They are raised to some extent, anywhere from six inches to uh, maybe three feet. Uh, they can be in the ground, as you see in one of these uh, uh, photos here, or the material can be enclosed. Uh, particularly, we are going to be focusing on this uh, kind of raised bed garden where the materials are enclosed, the soil media is enclosed, that is. And why have a raised bed garden in the first case? Well, first of all, it's easily manageable, especially if you have a small space uh, in the backyard. You want to do intensive gardening, and this bed garden enables you uh, to do that. Uh, there's obviously reduced compaction first because you start with a very good quality uh, soil or what you call the growing medium, but there's also an offer of protection from food traffic, uh, especially if you're thinking about the kids, children walking in your backyard. There's that protection, and this reduced compaction is going to be helpful to your crop production. And then there's also reduced pest problem. Um, you are starting with a good quality soil, um, and usually the way they obtain this soil is, as we are going to discuss later on, is made from that some, um, what I would call it artificial, not the natural soil that we are talking about. And those materials are inert in nature, meaning that uh, they do not have uh, pests, they do not have uh, uh, diseases in them, they do not have weed seed. So you are able to start with a very clean uh, garden. And also, lace bed garden have better drainage. The fact that they are raised, uh, it's a big plus that uh, they naturally drain well. And in terms of material conservation, uh, whether you are talking about water and nutrients, you see that it can be utilized more efficiently. You are going to concentrate all that in a smaller space, including the amendment. So you see that you are not going to have a whole lot of wastage when you use a raised bed garden. And then we have the ease of access. Um, you know, you can create them uh, in a way that they are tall and comfortable to where you can reach a garden without bedding. And this is particularly important for gardeners on a wheelchair. They can have access and be able to work. Also, those people who uh, are not comfortable bending, you can lay the raised bed garden to a level where it's quite comfortable for you to work. And then there's also the aspect of aesthetics. They look clean, they look tidy, uh, and you can be so creative and create the shape that you want. So they look so good, whether they're in the backyard or frontier. And then productivity, the fact that you start with the fertile soil, um, you can do intensive production, you can do multiple cropping, you can plant, you can put your plants so close to each other. So the overall productivity um, is very high. So I'm only talking about the positive, but somebody might be wondering, are there any downside of a raised bed garden? Well, I think one of the downside is the cost associated with this raised bed garden, buying the materials, uh, particularly the framework and the, the soil that you put in there will cost you some money. And I mentioned that uh, they drain well, uh, which is a plus, 
but then the downside is that you have to keep watering more frequently compared to in cloud bed so let's talk about the materials that are popularly used for raised bed garden and the, the top most of the list is the lumber and the lumber we have either treated lumber or non-treated lumber and with the treated lumber uh, it used to be uh, made with the pressure treatment and uh, they were using chemicals such as chromated copper arsenate uh, cca uh, that was before uh, year 2004 and those that treatment was not quite safe because the, uh, the arsenic would, would uh, leach to the soil and arsenic is a heavy metal which is means it's not good uh, we want to avoid this but you are unlikely to find the uh, cca material um, anywhere in the lumber store but in case it's there you want to avoid it currently um, they use uh, different type of copper treatment uh, alkaline copper quart or acq or copper azor or better still micronized copper quart and uh, if you think about quad, this is the material uh, they use for swimming pool as a disinfectant. So it's basically safer than what used to be done before. Uh, and you know that copper is a micronutrient, uh, meaning that uh, a little bit doesn't hurt the, the crop. And if it is too much, you are thinking that uh, if it is going to be toxic to your plant, that's a safety mechanism that is not going to get uh, to you. But as we are going to see later on my raised bed garden, I'm comfortable using the treated lumber because I'm aware that we are no longer using CCA lather. They're using either ACQ, CA, or MCQ. But there are people who want to stay away from any kind of treated lumber, and there's the alternative of using the non treated lumber. And for that, I recommend going to those that are naturally rot resistant and some examples of those natural rot resistant are redwood or black locust which will be the best in terms of longevity but it will cost you more uh, it can go anywhere from to three to four times compared to the cheapest lumber another alternative is cedar uh, which can last anywhere from 10 to 15 years it looks gorgeous and this is a raised bed garden on the side that is created using cedar. And uh, the only downside is as it is that it is also expensive. It can be as much as three times more expensive. Another alternative is uh, cypress, which is rot and insect resistant because it has some natural chemicals to provide that uh, resistance. It can go anywhere to six to eight years, which is good and relatively cheaper than the hardwood um, and the final you have the Douglas fir which can last five to seven years uh, it is relatively cheaper compared to any other uh, non-treated lumber but again this is a general overview uh, you want to check with your closest uh, store uh, to find out what is the cheapest option the other material that you can use are uh, rocks uh, if you are lucky enough to have the natural rock in your compound, you can make it into good use. Um, obviously, this can be a beautiful garden, a uh, cheap garden, which has little maintenance and can last for a very, very long, long time. Um, the only thing that you are thinking about is the labor cost involved in collecting these rocks and putting them together. And depending on the height of the bed, it might require you to purchase mortar and uh, actually try to seal uh, so that it doesn't crumble. Another material that is uh, popular is the uh, uh, use of uh, cinder blocks. And uh, as you can see on this picture, they can uh, create and give a beautiful garden. Uh, it's easy to create this garden because you can move, move one cinder block at a time. And uh, it's, it, you know that the garden is also going to have some longevity, but they are concerned with the cedar block, uh, particularly if you don't know what materials have been used to create them. There are some that are on the market where they combine concrete with fly ash, and fly ash 
is material that come from uh, from industry, from coal mining, and uh, it's used for building this uh, um, cedar blocks. And you don't want to have that in your garden because it may contain some heavy metals, particularly mercury, arsenic, and lead. So the bottom line is that if you're going to use cedar block, you want to inquire to make sure that they do not contain any fly ash. Another material is galvanized uh, metal, uh, like steel or iron, is always galvanized to make it more strong and sturdier. It's more durable compared to lumber. And uh, the only thing is that uh, the good quality material is expensive. And the cheaper ones tend to rust out and they are easily dented. And another downside to this uh, type of garden is that uh, iron uh, or, or, or steel is a good conductor of heat, meaning that these gardens can get extremely hot in full sun. And the appearance uh, may not be so present. The fact that they have this trash can kind of appearance, uh, maybe your neighbors may not like it, but Believe it or not, people are using them even in urban uh, neighborhood. What you want to avoid are railroad ties. I know they are very much available in ev almost everywhere in the US. The problem with the railroad ties is that they contain creosote, which is a preservative. And this is potentially harmful to human and environment. So you don't want anything like this close to your garden. And the EPA has released several warning regarding the use of railroad ties in urban areas uh, because of that potential of uh, having those chemicals from kerosene leaching and causing contamination. So you want to avoid these railroad ties. Another material that uh, some people use it, others try to avoid it is uh, old tires, uh, recycled tires. And I know you can use them in the short short term because you're only concerned about where they start degrading. When they start degrading after using them for a long time, they can release some biodegradable material uh, such as zinc and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, we call them PAH, which are not good for the environment. So I know you can use it. People use them for flower beds. And if you are concerned, you can always use a, a liner, uh, a fabric liner, if you're concerned about the leaking of this material. But if you can avoid the tires, we're well, good. Some other materials that can be used are pellets, use pellets. And uh, those ones are pretty much uh, available and in many places you can get them for cheap, maybe for free. Now you want to avoid this unless you know their source and how they were created because the old way of preserving this pallet included uh, treating them with methyl bromide. Um, and this one is not good because methyl bromide is potentially carcinogenic. But the ones that are uh, treated nowadays, they use a heat treatment. And how do you know which was are heat treat treated? You can look at that symbol, HT, to know, to know that they are using heat treatment and not methyl bromide, and they are probably safer. But another concern is what material they were used to ship. Uh, you want to find out because if they were shipping some dangerous chemical, uh, there may have been some possible leak. So it's kind of a gray area whether to use them or not. Unless you know the source, you should avoid them. So let's talk about the best growing media for a bed garden. And uh, a growing medium, I'm not just calling it soil, because a lot of them are, have like artificial material other than soil. Uh, but whichever material that you use, it needs to be porous because roots require both air and water. And you need uh, the material to have what they call the microspore, micropore, uh, those. <coughs> that will retain water. The macropore are those spaces that retain air, so for good aeration. And then you also want them to have nutrients in terms of primary nutrients, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The secondary nutrients, you are thinking of calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and the micronutrients, such as zinc, 
iron, copper, and so forth. And the figure here, I'm demonstrating the material. If you have material that has this composition, that would be great where half of the material is made up of void, the other half is made up of solid, and this solid will comprise of minerals and organic matter. The void will be the shared space between air and water. And if you have this balance and half half, that would be great. And the air space is what I call the micropore, and the water space is what I call the water. The water space is a micro micropore. The air space is a micropore. So, yeah. So, the medium must also provide physical support to grow healthy plants. You need the material to have good infiltration because that's the, the way the water gets into the soil profile. And you also want to have some good drainage. So some of the materials that are um, available on the market, uh, you can use a garden soil or topsoil. The plus of the topsoil is that it can hold water and the nutrients. However, most of the soil tend to have high bulk density of anywhere above 1.5 gram per cc. And this one can pack so much in a container such as, as a least bed garden. So what you are thinking with any type of container gardening, including the least bed garden, is that uh, the physical properties of the material tend to be more exaggerated. So if there is a bulk density that is favorable for your in-ground bed, which is about 1.5 gram per cc, if you put it in a container, it will be exaggerated to uh, approximate maybe 1.7, 1.6, 1.7 gram per cc. And this can reduce drainage. Um, when you reduce drainage, you mess up with the, the air space, which can drown your crops. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. Again, with the garden soil, it can harbor diseases, weed seed, uh, and other unwanted pathogens, uh, which is a, a, a downside. So the bottom line is that you want to avoid garden soil unless you know it has the right uh, physical properties in terms of bark density. You know the source. It doesn't have all those unwanted guests, uh, the disease pathogens and weeds as much as possible. Uh, then if you are not using the soil, what can you use? Uh, those are the materials I mentioned. They are called the soilless uh, mixes. And these ones are made up of organic and inorganic compound combined together. Uh, some of these examples include the wood chips, uh, peat moss, pyrite, and vermiculite. You have commercial soilless mixes that are already made. You don't have to do anything. They are ready to use. Uh, they are excellent choice for raised bed garden. Uh, they have lightweight, good relative bark density. They train well. They have good water holding and nutrient holding capacity, uh, which means that you don't have to do a whole lot of amendment. They are ready to use. Uh, they are generally free of weeds. The fact that they are not coming from a garden, they are free of insect pests and diseases, which is a big plus. And most of them are created to have an ideal pH, uh, which is favorable for most crops. And if you choose the ones that are organic soil mixes, you can be sure that they do not have they do not have any chemical agents, wetting agents at the substitute for organic compounds. So they are relatively safer, especially for those who are thinking about having an organic kind of gardening. And some of the examples that uh, I saw on the in the store, uh, such as uh, Miracle Grow, and I'm not going to recommend one or the other, but I would like you to watch the price because most of them work great, but they come at different uh, you know, pricing per quart. Uh, Miracle Grow, I saw a 50 quart costing $15.48. You also have a Miracle Grow potting mix. Um, again, 50 quart cost $14.48. Another company, uh, Star Green, has their own mix. And there I saw a 64 quart costing $11.48, uh, relatively cheaper compared to Miracle Grow. And then you have another one, the, uh, the garden soil, 
from harvest or organic. Um, that one, if you do the math, it's gonna be a little bit expensive. Uh, that 8.5 quart costs seven dollars forty eight cents. But this one, they use organic uh, material. Uh, I particularly use this because I try to be as organic as I can. Now, for large lace bed garden, you know that it, it can add up by those materials, uh, even if it, you are buying the, the cheapest material, um, $11 for 50 quart. And if you are thinking about having to buy maybe 30 of those bags, if you multiply, you realize that it can run into several hundred dollars to build just an average raised bed garden. So in that case, you might want to consider making your own mixes. And one way you can do that is you get horticultural grade vermiculite. If you can get like eight gallons mixed with eight gallons peat moss, add some 10 tablespoons of limestone, and then some garden fertilizer such as 10, 10, 10, you can add one cup plus five tablespoons of superphosphate to supply phosphorus. So other good media for uh, containers such as this bed garden are compost. If you can get, uh, uh, for example, the mushroom compost, and this is the one that we use for our garden on campus at Lando Farm. We use uh, a mushroom compost, and this one has worked very well. The only downside is that it's expensive. I remember the last time I bought the 40 cubic yard was anywhere about $1,200. But if you have a large area, maybe it's worth it. And then you can have a mix of garden soil, a quarter garden soil, and three quarters compost. You can also have a soilless mix that, as we talked about, like vermiculite, a quarter with a quarter garden soil and then 50% compost or a quarter of garden soil plus three quarter soilless mix or even half, 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 half soilless mix and half compost. And each of this one will work, will work well. So you do the math and decide what is most cost effective. So advantage of using synthetic or soilless mixes compared to soil, right, garden soil is that they are free of diseases, free of weed seeds. They have high moisture holding capacity. They have good drainage. They have high capacity to retain nutrient. Uh, they are generally light in weight. So very good for your container gardening such as this bed garden. Now, after you have created, you have the material, you have the media, how do you choose the best crop to raise in a uh, raised bed garden. And generally, most crops will thrive in a raised bed garden, but remember you have a little space, so you want to use that space as uh, conservatively as possible. Uh, think about some of the high yielding plants such as uh, tomatoes, but also your environment. Look at your backyard, front yard, where your garden is gonna be uh, constructed. Where, how much sun do you get? If you only have, have maybe like four or five hours of sunlight, you want to consider the leafy crops because those can tolerate partial shade. But if you are going to grow fruit, vegetables, such as tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, you need at least six hours of full light, direct sunlight each day. So that one will determine what you can grow in your Elizabeth garden. Uh, with root vegetables, uh, they do very well. The fact that uh, um, you have soil that is filled of rocks, clay, and debris, it allow root vegetables to grow without any hindrance. Uh, for example, the, the carrots, they can grow well without having misshapen shape. You know, you don't want a carrot that is forked for your consumption or for your market. Uh, so you realize that all those root vegetables, the carrots, beets, radishes, parsley, will flourish very well in that rock-free environment, and they will spread deep and wide, so giving you a good produce. The leaf vegetables do extremely well in this bed garden. Uh, this one, you can plant them as soon as you're able to work your garden, 
the fact that uh, they can be started when the temperatures are relatively low. Um, the leaf bed garden will help you uh, because it tends to warm up quickly compared to the surrounding soil, meaning that you can start your vegetables uh, quite early. Uh, the also leaf and vegetables drive well in well-drained soil, so they are good candidates for your garden. And uh, what kind of plants are we talking about? The kale, the collard, uh, spinach, chard, and all that. The onions, onions do well also in the leaf bed garden. Uh, first of all, they love very quick draining soil. They also need plenty of organic matter and they require a growing, a long growing season, meaning that you can start them early to have enough time to flourish. And also the fact that you can determine what you put in your garden. Um, if you are thinking of growing onions or other root crops, you want to have plenty of compost so that you can have a good yield. Tomatoes are heavy feeders and uh, they drive well in this bed garden because of the high uh, content of organic matter. They need the nutrient dense environment to drive. So like onion, you want to customize the soil to have some extra organic matter. Um, and then the only downside with tomatoes in raised bed garden is that it's harder to install the cages. The fact that uh, the soil is loose, uh, that can be a downside. Another downside is depending on the height of your, of your bed. I, I know we have those beds that are up to three feet tall. If you try to, inst to install a cage there, it will be so high even to work your tomatoes. So that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of the Elizabeth Garden. I'm gonna be showing a video of uh, the work that I did in my backyard. Sure, the video is open. Dr. Kathinji, can you turn the volume up on the video? Okay. Sorry, I didn't even know to what. Let, let, I'll try to share it again. Uh, okay.
Hi there, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Leonard Gedenji, and I work as an extension faculty in the area of sustainable and urban agriculture. And I'm also a backyard gardener, an urban gardener. Uh, this is my backyard garden. Uh, you can see in the background. It's a raised bed garden. And uh, last year, actually two years ago, is when uh, I established the garden. The first year went pretty well. We had uh, quite a bit of vegetables. We had some herbs, uh, particularly we had some sage, we had some cilantro, we had some parsley. And uh, this is some sage that I just picked in the background that we made from uh, last year. And uh, this year we are going forward to work on it. I bought some garden soil, this bed soil that you see here that I'm going to add uh, to finish the garden. I'm also going to be doing a bit of a uh, cleanup and also uh, raising the bed. I realized that uh, the last one and a half years, this soil, the terrain is not great. So part of the garden was too shallow. So I decided I want to increase the garden, raise the height by uh, half a foot or six inches. And uh, I got some uh, raised bed lumber and what I wanted to show you on this lumber is that uh, as you can see the color it tells you that uh, this is uh, treated lumber it's treated using copper and you can see the green color here and I am okay with the treated lumber because the chemical they use nowadays for pressure treating is relatively safe they use some copper based compounds and as you know Copper is a micronutrient, and, uh, which means it can supply copper to my plants. And of course, if it is too much, it will poison the plant before it poisons the, the person who is using it. So I'm really okay with it using the, this type of lumber. So I'm going to be building that. And I've already done quite a bit of that. I'm just uh, remaining with the last uh, lumber here. But I wanted to show you the tools that you need in case you are planning to build your own raised bed garden. Uh, a hammer is very good, especially if you are considering using uh, steel nails. I know some people would rather use some screws. And in that particular case, you want a set of screwdriver. For my case, I'm just using the steel nail. The hammer is good. You also want to have the corner brackets or the braces uh, to make sure that uh, you hold the two lumber learning perpendicularly in place. And as I mentioned, I'm adding another layer, meaning that I have to have a way of joining the top and the lower lumber. And I have these plates that I purchased at uh, Lowe's to do that job. And once I clean the garden and uh, I add the topsoil, and finish the construction. I'm going to be planting some vegetables and I have some kale here that I'll be planting uh, possibly today if not tomorrow morning. And uh, uh, for those who may be concerned about using the uh, treated lumber, you can use a fabric. I have a set of fabric here that you can line your garden. I'm going to be lining my garden, not because of uh, uh, much concern about the treated lumber, but you know when you, you join two lumber pieces, there's a gap that will be there and you can lose your soil or the growing media when you water the garden. So I'm going to be using this uh, fabric for that purpose. And I have a, a stable gun that I'll be using to attach the fabric and I'm also equipped with a box cutter that will help me uh, to do that. So uh, let me just do a quick demonstration about um, adding this corner brace. I uh, have already worked on the other side. I'm going to take my, my eight foot, two inches thickness and uh, join with a perpendicular piece and the uh, it's not difficult because I'm just hammering the nail. And I want to make sure that I, I start with the nail 
that goes through the two pieces and it helps if you're going to work as a team when you adjust by yourself you got to improvise a way of doing it and play with the, the corner blades in place and uh, I mentioned that uh, since I'll be joining the upper and the lower piece together, I'm equipped with my my blade, uh, my plate, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and hammer my plate in place. So for now, this will hold the pieces uh, together. I will do the uh, the final touches uh, later on. As I mentioned, the next thing I'll be doing is to clean up the debris from last year. Last year, I had planted some uh, kale at Collard, but because of the winter freeze, you can see that most of the plants are uh, bolted. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, as the weather warms up at the I'm going to be growing my kale, that that is not going to happen. So that was just a quick overview of what I'm doing with my backyard garden. It's usually very productive. Um, I try to use as much organic product as possible. As you saw from my miracle Grow raised bed soil, it's made of uh, organic material, meaning that they have not used any inorganic compounds. And uh, I'm going to be... Working on uh, compost, once I add this today and tomorrow, in future I'll be working on my compost so I can keep uh, replenishing uh, my garden. So I'll take some pictures later on to show you the finished garden, but now you have an idea of what I'm trying to work on. Thank you for watching and listening to me. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, um, uh, the garden I was working that I was doing that uh, yes, yesterday and uh, have us a few other videos that I'm going to share um, as we take the questions. Uh, let me share this. I'm going to share this without sound because it's just showing me working in the background as I take questions.
we're getting our questions ready here. Um, I can go ahead and read a few of them. Um, so we had a question, should you buy worms to add to the beds? Okay, so uh, having worms is very good. And, uh, it's a good sign that uh, our garden is doing well. I think if you, if you like to do that, that would be great because what I say is that when you are taking care of the garden, especially this bed garden, you are actually feeding the microorganisms or the macroorganisms in the soil so they can provide the benefit uh, for you. So if you have the worms introduced in your garden and you take care of them, feed them, provide the best environment for them, they will obviously help, especially with the organic garden because the materials that are put in the garden are organic in nature, meaning that they are not readily available for plant use. For example, organic nitrogen, organic uh, sulfur, organic phosphorus is not readily available unless it is broken down by organism in the soil. So the, the worms will break the bigger compounds, uh, which will be available for the smaller organisms such as fungi and bacteria who, who will break it further so that those materials are converted into inorganic form that the plant can use. So if you, if you have the chance of introducing the worms, well and good. Uh, but the bottom line is to feed those worms and any organism that are in the soil by taking care of your soil organic matter. Another, another question. Um, a number of people had questions about adding landscaping fabric or some other kind of material in the very bottom of the raised. Oh, yes, that's a very good point. You, before you put the, the garden on, uh, before you construct the garden, it's always advisable to put the, uh, the fabric at the bottom for a couple of reasons. One, if you're in an urban environment, you may not be sure what is sitting in the soil. And I know some of the research we have done with uh, some surrounding urban gardens in Petersburg, in Richmond, uh, we saw that there was elevated level of heavy metals, particularly arsenic, and in some cases, lead. So those heavy metals that are in the soil, you don't want them to come into direct contact with your soil. So putting a garden fabric helps with that. But most, another reason is that you are also going to use it to suppress the weed. Don't want weed, particularly grass weed, uh, growing from the bottom of the bed. So the fabric will help you with that. Uh, keeping the weed pressure down, as well as protecting from any possible contamination. Another question. Do people need to change out soil? Um, or what sort of amendments should they add after a few? Yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so eventually, no matter how good the soil, how the soil is, the soil that you started with, um, it's going to learn out of uh, nutrients because anytime you're growing produce and harvesting, what you are doing is uh, exporting the nutrients out of the garden. So you need to get, to keep uh, replenishing. Sometimes it's been, it may be necessary to replenish the whole. I think I was getting, where is the sound coming? I was getting some sound, I don't know where it's from. Just, yeah. Uh, but as I, I was explaining, uh, but adding organic matter, keeping up with it, and, and adding every year, especially compost, is a good way of uh, replenishing the nutrients. But in some, in some situations, you may have to come and start with the fresh soil, but you don't have to get all of it at the same time. You can just get a layer at a time, and then you come and put the, the fresh uh, nutrient rich soil or growing area because remember the 12 six inches is what matters most because that's where 
ambos o voy a usar algo de Fossil Trail. And the last question was, what are some good herbs to grow in rice beds? I need to stop. I need to stop the sound that is running in the background. So is there any, any other question? Let, let me, I'm looking at the chat now. Uh, so there's, there's a question um, about the herbs. Uh, what are some herbs that are good to grow in the raised bed garden? And a lot of herbs will do well. I had very good success with the parsley in my raised bed garden and I had more than enough to consume and to give out. Um, you just want to keep up with the um, pests and diseases. I know with my parsley, although it was very productive, I was also having this uh, uh, black swallowtail pest, that uh, beautiful looking moth and the larva that is green in color that really infested my parsley, but even after the heavy infestation, I was still able to harvest enough for myself. And I ended up actually using that pest infestation as a teaching moment for my kids. We are collecting those larvae and preserving them so we could see them turning into moths. And uh, but we discarded them after uh, observation. So a lot of herbs will do well. Um, I currently have planted dill, uh, no, um, a cilantro is also, you know, does very well. So a lot of them will do well to answer your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Kathenji. That was an awesome presentation. Um, I learned a whole lot and I hope um, a lot of you learned a lot too. Next Thursday, we're going to have Alex Hessler who, um, from Virginia Tech School of Plant and Environmental Sciences, and he is going to be talking about transplants. So we're approaching last frost dates, if you haven't already passed it, throughout the state. So it's um, kind of getting time to think about when you're gonna start moving some of your transplants out into the garden. Um, so we hope that you'll join us here next Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, and I will go back through the comments and see if you have any other questions. Um, you can go to the extension vegetable growing page, which um, I can post a link to. And um, of course, you can always reach out to your local extension master gardeners for questions as well. So thank you, everybody. So there, I, I'm just showing a quick, for those who may be interested to see how the garden, the last bit that I did was uh, adding the, the garden soil and uh, even in and out, and then uh, for that, I water the garden to make sure that uh, it soaked very well. And, uh, for that, that's the planting. We planted the, the kale. Yeah, the what I was doing is just using the, the hard trowel to make my holes, but also estimated I was placing them at one foot apart. So just wanted to show you how it looks. But otherwise, thank you so much for your time at the
Uh, anytime, Ms. Johnson, you are ready and you want to add the presentation, I'm okay with that. Okay, let me let me ask you a question. Is that mulch? Do you have mulch on your bed there? Actually, this is a uh, um. The, the, it looks like mulch, but uh, the, this is the the garden soil that I was using. So this is just a garden bed that uh, the garden soil that I was using. I have not added mulch yet. But you will mulch it. Yeah. Um. Last last year I had uh, added some mulch. I was just getting my grass creeping and using it as mulch. I may do that again as we get towards the, the summer and the fall. But uh, right now what you see is just that uh, organic garden soil. It has some of the particles that are large enough. I think uh, it probably has also some wood chipping. But that's well, just- looks awesome. Soil. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Kazindi. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye now. Mm -hmm.